Everybody scream peace. Tell them what you want, peace. Everybody needs peace. Everybody wants peace. Everybody needs peace. Everybody scream. Welcome to the American English webinar series brought to you by the American English team at the U.S. Department of State in Washington, D.C. My name is Katie, part of the American English team, also known as Moderator Katie. You'll also see my friend Moderator Heather in the chat box to help you. This webinar program is now called the American English webinar series. It used to be called Shaping the Way We Teach English webinar course. As you know, you can still expect the same great sessions. Our webinars are now 60 minutes long, and each month the webinars are related to a specific theme that you can also find on the American English website in Teacher's Corner. In addition to the webinar, you'll find resources, lesson plans, and much more related to the topic. Here you can see the schedule for this series. Our last webinar in the course will be held November 18th. It's entitled, Make It Meaningful, Bringing Learning to Life with Culturally Relevant Teaching with Tabitha Kidwell. <clears throat> Remember that after the November 1st time change in the US, <clears throat> excuse me, this webinar will take place in Eastern Standard Time. So be sure to confirm your local time um, using the link that we've provided. During these webinars, you will hear but not see the presenter. The way for you to participate is by using the chat box, as you are already doing. This is where you can ask questions or make comments related to today's topic. We, may, we may not be able to answer every question during the session, as there are often hundreds of teachers participating. However, there is another place to ask questions after the session is over. Your presenter may also ask you questions in the form of polls, so these multiple choice questions will appear on the screen for you to answer. Some people may experience technical problems. Unfortunately, we cannot fix everyone's technical issues, but we will let you know if we are having a global issue. If you do lose sound, a great way to follow along is with the caption pod. Each webinar series consists of six webinars. During the series, webinars take place every other Wednesday. Participants who attend at least four out of six webinars will receive an e-certificate from the Regional English Language Officer or local U.S. Embassy. To ensure you are eligible for the e-certificate, we will ask you to submit your attendance at the very end of the webinar. Please do not submit it before we request it or it won't be counted. At the end of the webinar, you will click on this link we give you and fill out the requested information. We hope many of you are already familiar with our Ning site, but if you haven't registered yet, please do join the site. Here you can find resources and discussion questions related to each webinar, as well as all of the webinar recordings. This is also where you can ask presenter questions after the webinar. If you visited the site before, you may notice it looks different during this series, but of course all the content is still there, just has a new look. And now for today's webinar. This session is Building Autonomy Through Cooperative Classroom Management. In this webinar, teachers will learn techniques that assist in creating effective cooperative and communicative classrooms, especially in classes of 20 students or more. Using the techniques illustrated in this webinar, teachers will learn how to maintain control while increasing student autonomy and providing each student with a role in the classroom management and with the opportunity to improve creative and critical thinking skills in English. It's my pleasure today to welcome our speaker, Dr. Gina Rhodes. Gina is an English language specialist currently living in Melbourne, Australia. 
She also works in the Master of Arts teaching program at the University of Southern California. Previously, she was a specialist in Ganzhou, China, a senior English language fellow in Shantou, China, a visiting scholar in the Strengthening Higher Education prog Project in Laos, and an English language fellow in Morocco. So welcome, Gina. We're glad. Great. Thank you very much for that introduction, Katie. It's great to see so many people here. This is excellent. I'm so excited. Um, so as Katie said, uh, we're going to focus today on building autonomy through cooperative classroom management. And I hope that all of you are as excited as I am to learn more about it. This is webinar 1.5. <laughs> okay. And so let's get started. As you'll see in today's agenda, it says uh, we're going to focus on what is cooperative learning. And we'll talk about the difference between the traditional classroom and the cooperative classroom. And then I'll teach you what PIES is. Um, after that, we'll talk about what I do in my classroom on um, rainbow learning. And I'll show you a video clip of some teachers um, learning, about the le learning about rainbow learning. And then we'll move on to some example activities of how you can use rainbow learning in your classroom. And we'll end with a quiz to summarize what we've learned today. So let's get started. OK. First of all, we're going to talk about what is cooperative learning. We're going to talk about the what and why. And then we'll move into the when and how. So let's look at the what. OK. What is cooperative learning? Before I tell you what I think cooperative learning is, please write your definition in the, in the chat box. Okay. Learning in groups, sharing, share teaching. It's moving so fast. Yeah. Yes, you guys have a lot of great ideas related to cooperative learning. Yes, learning a group, sharing. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of really great answers. Um, yes, it is a structured student interactions. Um, and we're going to talk about more about those structures. And again, we're going to talk about pies. Okay, so this is what it is. Structured student interactions and more specifically pies. And we'll talk about what pies is. But before we do, <laughs> let's um, take a, a quick poll and see if you can tell what is, which of these are cooperative learning situations. Okay, so it looks like a lot of you are saying, um, get up from your seat and look at what the others did. Yes, all right. So we've got a lot of people saying, verbalize to learn. Help your partner solve the problem. Okay, learning involves healthy noise. Okay, yeah, you guys are doing, uh, getting many of these. You're doing a great job. So let's look then back at some of these more specifically. Okay, great. Okay, so um, we're going to move now to talk about the traditional classroom. As you, uh, most of you said, in the traditional classroom, a good class is a quiet class. But in cooperative learning, we want to focus on learning creating healthy noise. And we'll talk more about healthy noise in a minute. And we move from keeping your eyes on your paper to help your partner solve it. And um, this is what um, Vygotsky likes to call the zone, of <laughs> the zone of proximal development. And by this, we mean that you have students in each team 
that have each have their own strengths and they help each other to improve um, as more quickly. Yes, the ZPD. Uh, good. All right. Okay. We move from sit quietly, quietly to get up and look around at what others did. And again, you hear we're focusing on learning from others so that everyone um, improves as quickly as possible and sufficiently as possible. Okay. Okay. And we move from talking is cheating to verbalize to learn. And this is especially important in a language classroom. The more we verbalize and the more we practice the language, the more we um, learn. Okay? Great. Okay. Okay, so now we're going to move on to um, not only the what, but also the why. Pi is um, the what and why of um, cooperative learning and why you want to, you would want to use cooperative learning instead of traditional um, classroom or instead of a traditional group work. Okay? And we're going to focus on the first one. The P of PIES is positive interdependence. Okay? And the I is individual accountability. The E is equal participation. And the S is simultaneous interaction. And now we're going to look at each of these ideas more carefully so that we can see the P is positive interdependence. Okay? And here we say is my gain, your gain, and is help necessary. And here we're focusing on the interdependence of each member of the team. A positive interdependence means that we're driving the group's cooperation by this, where the students need to work together in order to reach their goals. This leads us to the second letter, I, for individual accountability. Is individual public performance required? And this part of PIES holds that individual accountable for content and for sharing uh, among their peers. One thing that's important to remember in this is that the individual must perform in front of someone, not necessarily the teacher or the entire class, but for their team. So in order for everyone to reach their goal, everyone needs to be participating. Okay? So we've got individual accountability, and um, this is, again, an important part of PIES, an important part of the principles. And the last, uh, sorry, E is equal participation. And this one is a very important. How equal is the participation? And this enables equal opportunity and time for all participants. Um, talking time requirements and taking turns encourages the idea. And by this I mean that in a lot of the activities that you do with cooperative learning, um, each person talks for a specific amount of time, and the students take turns so that everyone gets a chance to stay engaged and um, participate in the discussion. This avoids hogs and logs. And by hogs and logs, we mean that one person wants to hog the time while others sit like logs. And this is one of the problems that many of you have talked about um, how um, in traditional group work that not everyone is participating equally. So we're going to talk about how to make this more equal. And this leads us to the last one, which is simultaneous interaction, and my favorite part. And here, what percentage are overtly active at once? Okay. The efficiency of our classroom increases when many students are interacting at the same time. And in this, we can see that, for example, if I have a classroom of 40 students, if I'm talking to each student one-on-one, -on -one, then I'm only hearing one student speak, and only one student is getting a chance to practice at one time. However, when we put our students in groups, um, we have a lot more students practicing at the same time. For example, if I've got 40 students and they're all in groups of four, 
then 10 students are practicing at the same time. And the more students you have, the more, of course, students would have the opportunity to practice at the same time versus the one at a time when you're doing most of the talking as a teacher. So let's just summarize quickly. We have positive interdependence, individual accountability, equal participation, and simultaneous interaction. And these Four principles work together, as Kagan calls them, to create the main principles of cooperative learning and cooperative classroom management. Okay, so now that we have the basics, let's look now at when. When should we use these? All right, and I noticed in the poll that many of you were saying that um, the percentage of time that your students speak speaking class is less than half of the time, and um, most of you were saying that they were sit in groups less than half the time. So when your students are in groups right now, it's less than half the time. So let's talk about why you're doing this less than half the time. In the chat box, tell me about some of the challenges that you've had in using cooperative learning or putting your students in groups. Noise, yes. <laughs> Discipline. Yes, yeah. Some students are shy, yeah. <laughs> Lots of clocks, yes. You guys, are, these are some of the problems that I had when I was a beginning teacher and very, very common problems when you're working with any group of students, okay? So we're going to talk about this, and we're going to talk about how many students I put in groups. So let's talk about the how. How do we do this? Okay. Um, so when I do this, I put my students in groups of four. Okay. And one student will be red, orange, yellow, and green. As you can see, they follow the color, the colors of the rainbow. And that's why it's rainbow learning. And I do this um, in Kagan's book. They talk about numbered heads together. But I found that when I um, used the students used numbered uh, numbers, for some reason, they always wanted number one to be the leader um, because they just felt that number one should be the leader. And I didn't want there to be always a specific person, the leader of the class. So I said, well, if I do colors, then they won't have that option. So, um, so I found that using the colors works a lot better. So um, we've got the four colors. Each student has a color. And um, I'm going to explain to you what roles they do as a color. But instead of explaining it all right now, let's first look at a video clip. While you're watching this video, I want you to think about what roles I gave each of the participants. And how do these roles relate to PIES? We mentioned the um, P-I-E-S earlier. So how are these related? So let's watch the video. No, that's good. All right, we're good. Okay, we got all the reds standing up. Reds, tonight, you're going to be the volume monitor. Okay, it's quiz time. What does the volume monitor do? <laughs> <laughs> remote control, like a TV, okay? <laughs> All right? Yes. If your team is loud, it's your fault. <laughs> All right? Okay. If, um, you are going to, when it's time for your team to be quiet and say nothing, it's your job to tell your, your team to mute, okay? No talking. All right? So you make sure the volume isn't too high or too low, and when it's time to be silent, you silence them, okay? You can do that, right? <laughs> okay, Red, you may sit down. Orange, stand up. 
Okay, orange is the language monitor. I'm going to go back here and talk to Okay, no hitting, no beating. You don't get to say English. Okay, no. I'd like to remind them, okay? Please speak English. Okay? This is our chance to practice our English. Let's take advantage, okay? Be nice to your classmates, though, all right? Yellow, stand up. Yellow. <coughs> your job is the participation monitor. Okay? Can you read it? It's a little complicated because it's yellow, okay? On a white board. All right. What do you think the participation monitor's job is? Right, yeah. Because you know, she's really shy. Yeah? She doesn't like to talk, so but she loves to talk a lot. <laughs> and so your job, after she's been talking, talking, you're like, you know, that's a really good point. I like it. But I would also like to hear from her, so let's give her a chance to talk to you, okay? So you both greens stand up, all the greens, green one and two, all right. Okay, green, you are the topic monitor, all right? Yes. You know, sometimes, I, I don't know, some of you are already teaching, yes, and sometimes when you tell your students to get in groups, they forget the topic, yeah? <laughs> They start talking about everything else except what you want them to talk about, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so your job then as the topic monitor is... Make sure all the team members get involved in the activity. Yes, on the mm -hmm. correct topic, yes. Mm -hmm. You can't talk about your boyfriend. <laughs> Okay, so we're back. <laughs> and we, hopefully you saw on the video um, how to, how I organized them in groups of four with red being the volume monitor who controls the volume of each team. Okay? And this person makes sure that each member of the team doesn't speak too loudly or too softly. And you know, we talked about this, but we want healthy noise but we don't want to have the students being so loud and so chaotic. So you have one person in each team whose job it is, is to keep their team from being so loud and um, from causing uh, other, to disrupt other classes and um, to make it impossible for other teams to hear, okay? They are also the person Who is the mute button? When you need the team to be quiet, then this person also is the one to silence their team. And again, an important role for the for the team to have, especially if you've got a class of 40 or more students. You need someone with a mute button. Okay. Now we're going to go on to orange. Orange is the language monitor. Okay. And as we talked about. This person reminds the team members to practice the target language. And then for, for our instances, this language is English, okay? And as I said, that they, if someone forgets, the language monitor's job is to remind the group politely, okay? And I emphasize politely because especially if you're working with children, we know that um, you can... Um, they can, they need a lot of help to remember to be polite and they need the language to be polite. And even when you're working with adults, it's always a good reminder and it's always good to teach them how to say things politely in English. Okay? So that's really an important um, role for your students to have. And we have also the participation monitor. And again, we talked a bit about the hogs and logs. So this person's job in their team is to make sure that everyone is participating equally. Okay? Again, politely, they remind the dominant group members to let others speak and encourage the quiet members to, to give their opinion. So we're getting an, more of an equal per participation. As we talked about earlier in PIES, we want to have that uh, equal participation 
the E in pies. Okay, so um, this is an important job to give the person in your group. Okay, and the last one is Green, who is the topic monitor and timer. Okay, and this person politely reminds the team to stay on topic if they forget, as we talked about in the video. And they keep track of the time it's required. And as I mentioned earlier, a lot of uh, the activities that you do, especially with cooperative learning, are going to be timed activities so that each member of the team gets an equal opportunity to respond and it is equally engaged in the, in the topic. So you want to make sure that um, you are uh, have someone who knows that if you have an activity that needs a timekeeper, that they're ready to do that. Okay. All right. So, um, and I just wanted to reiterate some things that I do with my class to make sure that um, the groups go smoothly. All right. The first thing I do is that. Um, I give the students the colors and they keep the same color for the whole time that they're seated with that team. Okay? However, I change the roles every class because students get bored doing the same role and they think, well, how come she always gets to be the language monitor and I don't? So I like to change it every class. I rotate the roles, but they keep the same color and I use the colors for everything in my class to who's, uh, who's going to bring the papers to the front of the class or um, who's going to take attendance for their team. Um, I'll change those. I'll, I'll keep the colors the same, but I, I'm always adding roles and changing the roles. Okay. Also, um, I like to keep them in the same teams for about four to five classes, um, but I usually change it when there's a natural break. When we finish a project or when we move to a new unit, then I'll give them new teams to work with. But I like to keep them in the same teams for a while because I, they get more comfortable with each other and it's easier for them to talk together. Okay? So those are some of the, the tips. And also, um, as you know, I have four colors and four people in each team, but it never works out <laughs> um, that you have an even number of students every day in class. Even if for some reason you have actually you know, 20 students or 40 students in your class, someone, is, someone might be absent um, or you have um, a couple groups of three students. And in this case, I'll double up the color of one of the members of the team. If someone is absent, for example, if green is absent in, for one day, I will ask yellow to take the role of green. So if I if it's green's turn to stand, then yellow will stand um, for both. If, for example, yellow is the language monitor and green is the volume monitor, that particular day, yellow will be the um, language monitor and the volume monitor that day. Okay, and those are some of the things we do to keep it up. And also, um, you'll notice that I like I have a language monitor and I want my students to be practicing English as much as possible during the class time. Um, but this can scare many of our students because <laughs> they don't know all the words that they need to know in English. But I tell them that it's perfectly fine to ask um, their teammates how to say something in their home language as long as they ask how to say it in English. So I teach them the expressions. How do you say blank in English? And in English, it's useful. And what does monitor mean? It means blank. Okay? So um, these are some of the things that you want to um, also remind your students often. Teach them these phrases at the beginning and maybe post them in the room if you have the room to yourself so that they can remember these phrases and use them often in the classroom. And some of you have asked, what do you do if the students aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing with their team? And so what I do with my students as we as a class will come up with the penalties. Anytime you give your students a rule, there has to be a consequence if they don't follow that rule. And my students often say that they want um, the teammate to sing a song in English or stand for a certain amount of time, like 
stand for two minutes or stand for five minutes or do something ridiculous. And this year, the ridiculous thing they often um, chose was um, to do to dance Gondam style. Raise your hand if you have uh, danced Gondam style or at least seen the video. One person? No. Okay. There we go. There's more hands going up. Good. Yes. Yeah, so every many people know about Gondam style. But the, so this year, um, well my, many of my students selected that as the penalty if someone on their team wasn't doing their monitoring role. Or they might say that they have to write a reflection of some activity they did in English or bring candy to class. Bringing candy to class is also a very common one for my students. They like that one. Okay, but again, I just want to reiterate that the students decide the penalties. And as long as you keep it fun and light, then the, it's it's not a horrible thing to have to do the penalty because we want the students to feel that it's a relaxed environment, but they still need to follow the rules. Uh, so um, as long as you keep it fun and light and you are enforcing the penalties, the students love to enforce the penalties. If one of the students isn't doing participating or if somebody says, uh, he spoke um, Chinese and you didn't say anything, you're the language monitor, you're supposed to stop him. So, they, um, they love to enforce the penalties. So it's like I said, if you create a fun environment where everybody's um, enjoying it and participating, then um, it makes the class go well. And, it, and again, it takes away some of the chaos that can be created by group work. So let's move on to some activities. What I'd like you to talk about in the chat box now is how you would um, do activities, cooperative activities, with a unit about peace. What are some of your ideas? Okay, I think fair share. That's a good cooperative structure. Good. Two role plays. Good idea. Performing from the class, group work, yes. Debates, yes, great. Sing a peace song. You guys have excellent ideas. These are great. A you in role play, very nice. Okay, great. I love some of these ideas that you're coming up with. We've got um, create a poster. Oh, yeah. I like it. Okay. Well, these are some of the things that I did with my students. And especially when I was introducing the team, um, uh, introducing the idea to, the, to each of the teams, I would have them take turns making a list of words related to peace. And by I mean take turns, um, they have one piece of paper and they pass it to each team member and each uh, one team member writes a word that they think is related to peace on the paper and, and every again, everybody's staying involved and staying um, motivated in the team, okay? And they're talking about the topic. They can talk about their definitions of peace. What does peace mean to them, okay? And they can discuss the time when they or someone they knew had a conflict and how, um, how was that conflict resolved? Was it a peaceful resolution? Was it a not a peaceful resolution? What happened and how could it have been resolved in a different way? So they talk more about um, peace in this way. Okay, great. And then as many of you mentioned, um, as you get into the unit, you might have them do role plays or a presentation or a debate, as you mentioned, um, that's related to peace. So th again, these are some ideas of how to um, get the students involved um, in the topic and to be discussing it um, cooperatively with their team. Okay? Okay, so yes, making posters and symbols of their own, symbols what peace means to them. These are some great ideas. Okay, now I've been talking a lot about speaking and what um, the importance of speaking um, in our classrooms. But cooperative classroom management isn't always just about speaking. Yes, the students are in teams, but the teams work to help in all four of the basic roles. <coughs> Listening, speaking, reading, and writing. Okay? 
So in the next one, I'm going to show you a reading, and I want you to think about what type of activities the students could do to help with their reading. So what cooperative activities could they do with this reading? Okay. It says that you have to serve the customers. The boss told her as he punched her. If not, we will beat you to death. Do you want that? Raph stopped protesting, but she sobbed and refused to cooperate actively. The boss forced her to take a pill. The gangsters called it the happy pill. <clears throat> now this is from the book Half the Sky, and this um, is from, uh, I use this a lot with uh, when I teach courses on world issues and peace education and gender equality. So it may or may not be appropriate for your class. So it's always remember to um, to choose materials that are the best for your level and for your students. Okay, But I find it works really well with my students. Um, it really gets them talking. We have great discussions. Okay, You guys are coming up with more great ideas. Okay. Continuing the story, yeah, write their own continuation, discuss them in thought, make a dialogue, okay, transform it into a poem. We have a lot of poems in this group today. This is great. Okay. <coughs> Interview the characters for a talk show, okay. Okay, they can finish the story. Yes, this is great. Okay, well, you guys have a lot of great ideas. You can have a problem-solving discussion. This is good. Okay. And discuss what rights were violated. I like that. Okay. What rights were violated by Wrath? Okay. Or what of Wrath's um, rights were violated by her boss? Okay. A chain story, one of my favorites. Okay, what one of the things I had my students do was a quick write, and a quick write is where each student individually writes um, for five to ten minutes about what they think about the the paragraph that they read. And so I'll say, "What do you think this story is about?" And so they individually write for um, five to ten minutes, yes, to predict and think about um, this. Yes, it's also called a free write. Yes. Yeah. So they're just writing their ideas. They're not worried about um, what they, um, how they should organize it. They're not worried about an introduction, body, and uh, and conclusion. They're just writing their their ideas as they think about it. And that's what we mean by a quick write. Okay. All right. And then after they've written it, then they talk with their team about what they wrote. Another one is a team Q&A. And when you do a team Q&A, you can provide the questions and the teams discuss the questions together. Or you can have um, some of the students, like you could say um, two colors write questions and two colors are going to answer the questions. So you can decide depending on your um, what you think the level of your students. Okay. Okay. What job does Rath have? They could try to brainstorm that, what job they think she has. Um, why did her boss punch her? What did she do? Why did he um, Why did he feel the need to punch her? Why would he do that? That's evil. All right. And why doesn't she want to do her job? What is it about her job that she doesn't want to do? And there are lots of other questions that you could come up with in this um, that your your students could write, or that again, or you could write related to this. Okay. You can also do a jigsaw reading. Some of you mentioned this earlier. okay? And in this, each member of the team gets part of the story and teaches it to the rest of the team. So you give them the whole story, and it's divided into four parts. And each um, member of the um, team summarizes and tells the main ideas of their part of the story. And then the team together puts it in the correct order. okay? Yes, you guys are you've got great ideas. I'm seeing even more great ideas about this. Deeper discussions, right? About violence and gender, right? Lots of great ideas coming up from the chat box. Okay? Okay. 
Now, after my teams discuss, I like to have a whole class discussion together. Okay? Um, for example, I call on one color and have that color stand. And then, um, for example, I'll say, okay, green, I want you to summarize what your team discussed or give the answer to a specific question. Okay, I use the colors for everything in my classroom, and that's why I like the fact that they always know what their color is, because then I can switch them into different groups or move them around quickly because everybody's got a color and everybody usually knows what their role is. But after the team discussions, I really like to um, hear what they had to say because, of course, if I've got a room of over 40 students, I couldn't hear every team at the same time. So we like to summarize, and then the students, get, again, can learn from each other um, and they can um, learn more together again. Okay, so now we're going to go back to the beginning and review the main ideas of the um, of today. Okay, so let's see if you remember what pies are. What is the P in pi? And what is the I and the E and the S? Oh, I'm getting a lot of perfect scores. You guys are doing great so far. Well, okay, not all. Most of them you remembered. Okay, let's then, let's look. Now that most of you have had a chance to answer, and you guys are doing great. Okay, I will go back. Okay, great job. Yes, you were right. Positive interdependence. The students have to work together to achieve their goal. Individual accountability, everyone has a role to play and everyone needs to uh, participate in their role for the task. Okay, Equal participation, we have um, a participation monitor making sure that everyone is participating equally. And simultaneous interaction, during the discussions many students are interacting at the same time so you're optimizing the number of students practicing their English in your class. Okay. Great, okay, let's review the next one, okay. We, we know that we have the four monitoring roles, the volume monitor, the language monitor, the participation monitor, and the topic monitor and timer. And so what are some other roles that you could give your students if you were going to do this with them? Oh, the reader, good. Reporter, note taker, okay. writer, recorder, narrator, speaker, yeah. Right, well a lot of you are saying speaker and as I said I usually don't assign one person to be the speaker um, to summarize at the end because I, I want everyone to be participating and wondering who I'm going to choose to be the speaker. It keeps them all engaged and um, motivated because they don't know which, which color I'm going to call after they finish their discussion. Speed moderator, nice, okay. Okay, you guys have a lot of great ideas, okay. Culture moderator, I like that one. Very nice. Okay, good. Yeah, and um, yeah, and notice that I again, like I said, I don't like to put one person in my class. I, I of course everyone does things differently. I don't like to choose one person who is the specific leader of the um, team because I like everyone to feel that they have a they each of these mon monitoring roles are. Um, equal, that everyone on the team is equal and that they everyone um, is leading 
something in their team. So there's not one person that's in charge. Okay. Okay. Yes. So that they're all working together and they're all um, building their autonomy and they're all staying engaged and motivated. All right. Evaluator. Good. Okay. And editor is another really good one. Yeah, I like those. You guys have such great ideas. Okay. So um, we're getting close to the end, but before we do, I know you all have a lot of questions, but there are a few that I get often, so I wanted to take a time to answer some of the frequently asked questions that I get when I talk about this. And as we talk, and many of you have mentioned before that you have a lot of students in your classes, you have large class sizes, so how could you possibly do this? And my answer to this question is um, mostly that the more students you have, the more important it is to do this because um, if you have 40 students in your classroom, if unless you're putting them in groups often and they're speaking to each other, then they're not going to um, have many opportunities to speak um, during their class time. Okay, and I see some of you. How many of you have, raise your hand if you have more than 40 students in your class. Raise your hand. Yeah, I see a lot of hands going up. Right. So this is a very common problem around the world. Um, as teachers, we know we would love to have smaller classes, but it's just not the, the reality. Okay. So the more students we have in class, the more opportunities we want to be giving them to use English in the classroom. So um, hopefully some of the ideas today can help you see how you can organize your students and to do this. You'll notice in the video that there were over 100 um, participants in my, in my workshop and I had them all in groups and all participating. And yes, there was healthy noise, but they were following the roles, they were using the volume monitors, so that made it possible. Okay. It takes a lot of time. How can I work it into my classroom and still have time to cover the material? Okay, this question I get a lot. I'm like, yeah, this is really nice, but I have all this um, material that I have to cover. Okay, how many of you have a set curriculum in your classroom and you have to finish it at a specific time? Raise your hand. Right. So it's also very common. Um, many in many classrooms around the world, you have a specific uh, amount of material, you have to get it covered by a specific time so they can take a specific exam. This is just the reality for what we do. However, what I have found is that when I put my students in groups and they get used to talking in groups and we're discussing the material, that it actually moves faster and my students understand the material better because they're staying engaged with the material. So they're learning the English that I need them to learn for the exam and we're covering the material faster because they're getting it and they're engaged. They're um, having uh, fun with the language that I want them to learn and I need them to learn for the exam. Okay, uh, this one I get a lot too. I tried this before and it's just too loud. How can I do cooperative communicative activities without disturbing other classes? And so hopefully, as you've seen, this um, with the volume monitors, it really helps a lot to have someone in charge of that. But I won't fool you and tell you that it is not loud the first couple of times. If your students aren't used to talking to each other, if they're used to sitting quietly in a classroom, they're, especially the younger they are, um, the more talkative they become. So it, it will be loud the first couple of times, but if you keep enforcing the roles, uh, especially of the volume monitor, and keep them working on tasks, they get used to it. The more often you do this, the more um, they get used to speaking to each other, and their language gets better, um, but they, uh, and they're no longer, um, afraid of talking to each other and they're not nearly as loud. It gets a, a lot easier. But it is a little crazy the first couple of times. But don't let that scare you. It gets better. Okay. And the last question is, where can I find out more about cooperative learning and how to use it in my classroom? And that's a very good question. Okay. 
Um, you'll notice here that these are the references that I used when I was preparing for this webinar. And the one in blue is the article that many of you have already read. It's on the Ning, as is the video that I showed you today. It's all on the Ning. Um, so if you would like to learn more about how to organize a cooperative classroom, then please feel free to read the article on the Ning, or you can also find it at AmericanEnglish.state.gov. Okay, and that leads us to the end. So thank you for participating. I do have a few minutes left for questions or comments. So anybody has any questions? And of course, also notice um, you can um, go to the Ning to discuss more. Um, also, if you would like to like my Facebook page, if you have Facebook, it's Gina Rhodes, EDD. And I, I'll be posting information about this webinar there as soon as I get a chance, after we have some more discussions on the name. And um, lots of useful information on my Facebook page. OK, and a lot of you have talked about assessment. How do you assess? I personally um, don't assess what their their discussions in the group, but how um, how they dis, um, discuss in the group will be shown on their exams. If they're talking about what they're supposed to be talking about, if when we do the whole class discussion, um, they're go, they're um, answering correctly, then I that's how I do the informal assessment of how well they participated as a group. And if I see that one particular group is not getting the correct answers, then I'll, I'll talk to them specifically and help them get back on track. Um, but I do informal assessment with the teams. And, but the more effectively the teams work together, the better they do on formal assessments. OK, and someone is asking um, about organizing them by the same level of proficiency. <clears throat> I actually um, specifically try not to organize them with every person in the team being the same level of proficiency. I like to mix it up because everybody has their strength. Someone may be lower in speaking, but higher in writing, or um, a great note taker, but um, shy. And the more they work together with people from different proficiency levels, um, the more everybody improves. So I try to. Um, mix it up for those reasons. And um, the more advanced students get more practice because um, we learn more by teaching others. So the more they're helping others, the more they're improving their language as well. What number is best for the group? Well, as I mentioned, I like to have four, four students in my group um, so that I've got red, orange, yellow, and green. But as I said, sometimes you can't always get four. So that's when one person will, um, if I have a group of three, one person will have two colors. Um, OK, and I'm getting another um, question about what to do if the students are not working with their group mates. Again, that's why we have the penalties. So if the students have. I find that if the students create the penalties and the students are enforcing the penalties, then, um, then they really enjoy making sure that everyone is participating and staying involved. So usually it's not a big problem with my students because they're enjoying working together with their team. But if it becomes a problem, then sometimes I, I have stopped a group and said, OK, what, what is it? What, um, what, why is it that you guys aren't working together? And we'll have a discussion about it and um, have them come to a conclusion as adults. <laughs> OK? And the last question I have time for today is, how do you control the volume when the volume monitor is also seriously involved in the activity? Well, I hope that the volume monitor will be seriously out involved in the activity. That's always part of that's all my dream. Um, but yes, the volume monitor um, should be remembering to do their job. And if they're getting too loud, I will come over and 
tap the volume monitor on the shoulder and remind them of their, of their job. That's usually what I, I try to do it as unobtrusively as possible. But that's usually how I handle that. And, and dish out the penalty if necessary. Okay? All right. Thank you very much. And I hope you guys have a great time. And I will see you in the name. Thanks, Gina, for sharing the PIES model for cooperative learning with us and for demonstrating how using classroom management techniques such as rainbow learning roles can enhance cooperative learning experiences, even in large classes. And thank you so much to our webinar audience for your great ideas today and your thoughtful consideration of the ideas. And please continue this discussion on the Ning. We'd love to keep the conversation going and to hear um, your other ideas as well. So be sure to check out all the great resources that are available for you on AmericanEnglish.state.gov and we look forward to learning with you um, in our next webinar, <clears throat> the final webinar of this series, which is Make It Meaningful, Bringing Learning to Life with Culturally Relevant Teaching. This will be presented by Tabitha Kidwell and it takes place right here on November 18th at 8 a.m. or 1 p.m.